Hi, everyone. I think we can start now. Um, okay, so welcome to the new session. Uh, now we will have Alexander that will talk about entanglement and belling inequalities and um, violation X to that Z with anomalous coupling. But before we start, I just remind you that there was some people sick this morning. So in case you didn't know these and you get sick, just let us know if we can help. And also the other thing is we are going to have our first panel discussion this afternoon. So if you still have a question, there is still a little bit of time to include it in the Google Doc. Uh, and now we have also put the, all the names of the people in the panel in Indico, so you can also see who will be in the panel. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much for the introduction. So. Well, first of all, I would like to start by thanking the organizer for inviting me to give this talk. And actually what I'm going to do is to talk about one of the last work I have done in collaboration with Paveo and Jakub, and whom that has a subtitle, Entanglement and Bell Inequalities Violation in Higgs to Set Set with Anomalous Coupling. So I, as you may have guessed, this is just a follow-up of the work that Jesus Moreno has just presented us to us, sorry, uh, like a few hours ago. And in case you have forgotten, in this work, what we showed was that the entanglement and the very inequality violation uh, are both theoretically ensured and experimentally accessible when dealing with a pair of set bosons coming from a Higgs decay. So one or maybe, look, um, you may ask yourself, you may wonder, can this result be extended, for example, when considering anomalous coupling between the Higgs and the set bosons on even, or even a little bit farther? Can we extend this statement of the entanglement and Bell inequality violation, but when dealing with generalized, I mean, other kind of processes? And these are the questions that we, has and we have answered during this work. As the, and the main goal is to develop an, an analytical strategy for testing entanglement and ensuring bell inequality violation. But in this case, in a much, in a much broader kind of processes, we are just considering that we have a spin zero particle that decays into two vector bosons, provided that mm, the vertices that appear in this decay are CP conserving. So once we have this, we have applied this result, but in the case of the decay chain of the Higgs decay into two set and its consequent decay into four charged leptons. And we, uh, the peculiarity that we have introduced an anomalous coupling, CP conserving coupling between the Higgs and the two sets. So before entering into details, let me remind you some for sure things that the mathematical tools that you have seen during these weeks, but there, during this week, sorry, but there are some subtleties, some new features that you may find interesting. So the first of them is that we are going to consider as always a bipartite quantum system. In this case, the Hilbert spaces of both Alice and Bob are um, the Hilbert spaces of the possible projection of the spin. And therefore, because we are considering vector bosons, we have that the spin is equal to one, and therefore we are, three, and we are dealing with Q tricks. The second fact is that I'm going to denote the expectation value of any kind of operator with respect to the density matrix that we have in, in hand by this sandwich over here that is just a trace of the product of the density matrix times the um, observable. This is the feature that maybe is new and is the fact that we are going to measure, I mean, we are going to quantize the entanglement of, in this case, the pair of vector bosons by using what it is called uh, logarithmic narrativity. That is an entanglement measure and its explicit form is given by this function over here. It's just a function of the density matrix that is given by the logarithms in base three because of normalization purposes of this argument. And this argument is the one trace of the partially transposed uh, yeah, of the partially transposed of the density matrix with respect to either Bob or Alice. I mean, it doesn't matter because uh, in the end they have all the same eigenvalues. And why I'm saying this? Because this one norm of in general, a matrix that is given by this expression over here is exactly equal when the matrix we are considering is squared to the sum of the modulus of the eigenvalues. And in here, uh, I would like to point out the fact that this actually relates the perez horodek criterion that is basically uh, looking at if this partially transposed matrix has a negative eigenvalue with a way of measuring the entanglement looking at, let's say, the sum of these negative uh, eigenvalues. And finally, that's to recall that this inequality, the inequality that we are going to use is the CJLMP inequality that is optimal in a sense when dealing with uh, 
Hilbert spaces of dimension larger or equal to, to three. And that this inequality can always be uh, written in this way. This is as an expectation value with respect to the density matrix of an operator that instead of depending on the emission operators, it's they, their self, it depends on some unitary matrices, unitary matrices, sorry, that are uh, equivalent to considering this kind of emission operators. So let's move on. And here is the kind of states that we are going to work with during the whole work, during the whole presentation. And these are just the general scalar state of a, of a pair of vector bosons. These uh, kind of states were presented first by Alan, Pavel, and Jakub in 2022, but it was published in 2023. And they, have, they are represented by this form over here, where we have a metric that is contracted with the corresponding amplitudes. Uh, with these corresponding amplitudes. And in this case, the metric is just the standard Minkowski metric in the mostly negative signatures, plus a new term that is dependent on both the momentum of the one of the vector bosons, and that in this case I have denoted by K, and of the other momentum of the other vector boson that is denoted by P, and also depending on some parameter, real parameter C, that enters directly proportional to this term. And for completeness, I have also shown here the, the expression, the explicit expression of the amplitudes. So with this into account, if we go a little bit farther and consider that we are, as always, working in the center of mass frame, this uh, momentum can be expressed in this much more simpler way, in which we have also considered that the momentum is aligned with the set direction. And therefore here, well, the omega sub one and omega sub two are just um, some functions of the first the mass of the scalar particle that decays into the vector bosons, and also independent on the off-shell masses of both of the, of the vector bosons. So taking all of this into account and plugging this expression over here, what we find is that this state has this much more simpler expression that it may be familiar to you because it's exactly the same expression as Jesus showed before. But in this case, instead of having here the parameter beta that Jesus was explaining that is exactly this parameter, we have mm, introduced a new parameter called well, that we have denoted by kappa. And that is just the parameter beta plus some new term that is directly proportional to C. So in particular, when C is equal to zero, we recover the case that Jesus presented and in the, the, it's the standard model case. So now the question is, what is C? I mean, what is this parameter that was introduced firstly in this uh, paper? Can we relate it to something physical? And the answer is yes. But for that purpose, we have to recall the amplitude of the general Lorentz invariant CBT conserving coupling of a scalar and two vector boson. And in particular, we are going to use the parameterization given in this paper. So uh, taking into account this paper, the amplitude is going to be directly proportional to this sum of three terms. The first two of them are just the CP conserving terms. While the second one, uh, sorry, while the third one is a CPO term. Then here we can see that the Levi Civita tensor uh, enters into the contraction of the momentum and so on. So, by comparing this amplitude with the general structure of our state, and in particular with the structure of the metric, and taking into account the transversality condition of the amplitudes, it is straightforward to see that the new parameter C that we have introduced is just the quotient between these two couplings, V2 and V1, weighted with the um, scalar product of the momentum. So with this, we have finally find an, uh, found an interpretation of the parameter C. Not only that, but also that uh, we can see that here, the parameter V3 does not enter into the game. Why? Because we were considering that our BV state was a pair of, uh, was a scalar uh, state. So therefore it makes no sense to in, to this parameter V3 that takes into account the CP odd component to enter into, into the expression of C. So from now on, we will consider V3 equals to zero and we will only deal with CP conserving coupling. A thing that may worry you is the fact that here we are um, dividing, I mean, we have a quotient and in the denominator, we have V1. So what happens when V1 is equal to one? Uh, zero, sorry. I mean, when this uh, doesn't not make sense. Well, in that case, what we can prove is that the general state, the general vector, uh, the general state of the vector bosons is a completely separable state. So it doesn't, it, it's not relevant to try to analyze entanglement or very inequality violation of, of a separable state because it's separable. 
So with this, with all of this in mind, into mind, let's move on and look for a more realistic scenario in which, in which we, instead of having a single event, as Jesus also explained in the in the talk, in the previous talk, we will consider an ensemble of events, and therefore we have to integrate over the possible masses the corresponding density matrix of a single event times the um, probability distribution function. But in this case, because well, as I will mention now. Uh, how can we obtain this probability distribution function? Well, this was actually obtained due, uh, using Monte Carlo methods in the paper that was presented just before. But in general, if we do not have this C equal to zero, we have to take into account the differential cross section of, for example, this kind of processes. I mean, the spin zero particles decay into a pair of vector bosons and it consequently decay into four fermions. And this differential cross section is given by this trace over here, when where we have the multiplication of the density matrix time, time the, the tensor product of the decay matrices of each of the vector bosons that Jesus introduced before. So now, actually, integrating with respect to the angular dependence and then differentiating with respect to the masses, what we find is that this differential cross section, in this case, with respect to the masses, is exactly equal to the probability distribution functions that we were looking for. And in particular, if we take, uh, for example, this case, I mean, the Higgs decay into set and into charged leptons with an anomalous coupling that was given in this paper over here of Stavoskin and Korchin, what we found is that this is exactly uh, this combination of functions where N is just a normalization constant that uh, it's not relevant. And here the functions lambda is a quadratic function, symmetric quadratic function of three different variables. And D is just the expression over here where we have uh, introduced the um, on shell mass of the vector boson and also the decay width of the of the corresponding de vector boson. And here we have the parameter kappa that I mentioned before. So once this uh, distribution function is obtained, uh, the complete matrix can be just obtained by integrating, as I mentioned. And this is the theoretical way of obtaining the density matrix. But experimentally, this must be obtained via some quantum contomography methods that has already been explained. So in general, this is the, the explicit uh, form. As you can see, it's almost empty. I mean, the, the, the matrix has only nine in uh, different nine components different from zero, and they are related. And these components are not coefficients are not numerical coefficients. In this case, they are polynomial on C, I mean, on the parameter that we introduced before. Whose, and the coefficients appearing in the polynomial are given by this kind of integrations. I mean, integrating with respect to the masses, this combination of, of functions. You may say, well, this could depend on C. I mean, I can see here a C dependence and I can see here a kappa that is also dependent on C. So what happens? Well, actually the dependence cancels. As it may can and it may be seen, for example, for the Higgs into set bosons and into charged leptons, the dependence on C of this probability function is just equal to two plus the, the K square here. So in this case, they cancel, and this is just a numerical factor. Um, in particular, for this specific case, what we have found is that A is just a constant, B is a quadratic polynomial in C, and D is just a linear function. But what, why is this important? I mean, it's okay, we have now find, found this uh, density matrix, but the relevant part is that if we notice this matrix has exactly the same symmetries in the sense that it has zeros over this component than the one presented by Jesus. And therefore the perez horodecki criterion that in principle was a sufficient but unnecessary condition is still being a sufficient and necessary condition. And in particular, what we have seen is that this matrix is going to be entangled as long as the off diagonal terms has, are different from zero. So for example, in the case of Higgs decay into two sets, A is different from zero. So just theoretically, uh, the entanglement is ensured. And this is independent on the value of the anomalous coupling. I mean, here, the anomalous coupling is encoded in this parameter C, and this parameter C does not affect the absolute value of A. But imagine another case of theories in which we have that A is exactly equal to zero. Well, in that worst case scenario, what we can see is that in D is just going to be a function, a linear function of C. So the only possibility for this matrix to be separable is that D is, equals, is exactly equal to zero. And this only happens when C is 
fine-tuned in a way that it cancels these two terms. So in the general picture, in the general scenario, our matrix, our de the density matrix associated with two vector bosons coming from a spin zero particle is an entangled matrix. So the way of quantize this entanglement comes, as I mentioned before, using this uh, neg logarithmic negativity. And the way of seeing whether the matrix violates or not the Bell inequality is given by following two different optimization strategies. The first of them is the same, but with a little twist than the one presented in Jesus Moreno's talk, while the second one is inspired by an idea presented in this paper. So regarding the first strategy, why I say it has a little twist is because we have to introduce the C dependence on the optimal matrices that we can find. But well, this actually is easy to implement it and it doesn't change anything. So it's okay. I would like to elaborate on this second idea, this second strategy that for me is the is some important result. That is the fact that here, what I have called an idea is actually a theorem that states that any pure state that is entangled, it uh, violates the Bell inequality. That was something that Horodesky mentioned before just in the previous talk. So taking into account this theorem, well, well not only they give this result, but they also give a way of constructing the different operators that leads to this violation. So by using this idea, but in this case with our density matrix, that is not pure. I mean, our density matrix is entangled, it's entangled, obviously, but it's mixed because we have integrated with respect to some probability distribution function. But although it's a mixed state, using the same idea, we can find that under this parameterization of the different unitarity, unitary matrices, that is exactly the same actual setup of the um, violation for the um, singlet state, we can find that the violation of the Bell inequalities is ensured for any value of the anomalous coupling. So this is wonderful. Let's see the plots. Let's see how does it work. But first, we need to know which is going to be the allowed ranges for C, and in particular for K. Why K? Because this is the parameter I used, well, we used, sorry, for um, uh, optimizing the, the unitarity matrices, unitary matrices. So these are the corresponding correspond these are the correspondence between the parameter C and the parameter Kappa. These are all the possible uh, scenarios. And we have to take into account different bounds. For example, some experimental bounds taken into account, for example, this paper of the CMS collaboration, they give some upper bound on the anomalous coefficient of the Higgs to the set. And using this uh, data, we can find that the permitted, the allowed value for C is more or less 0 0.23. This may seem actually like a very narrow space, but this all is only for the case of Higgs to set set. And as this is presented in total generality, this can be extrapolated to other scenarios and so on. So in each of the pros process we are dealing with, we have to take into account the corresponding experimental bounds. And Mm, the part that mm, the theoretical bound side is much more uh, not, uh, soft in the sense that it does not restrict any of the values of C. Uh, in particular, we have to take into account the perturbative unitarity bound. So with this in mind, I'm supporting the argument in the sense that this is completely general. We have taken into account a much larger um, range of C than the one permitted for experimental bounds. And these are the different results. For example, for the logarithmic negativity, we can see that the state is going to be always entangled, as I mentioned before, but now we can quantize this kind of entanglement. And for example, for the allowed values of C in the, um, for the Higgs to set set, we can see that the entanglement is almost maximal. Here I have also plotted the curves for different cuts on the, um, on the masses of the, of the off shell, most, I mean, of the smallest, a mass of the vector boson that as Jesus mentioned as as uh, we increase in the different cuts the entanglement we can see here how it also will increase although the statistics are reduced well uh, with re regarding the Bell inequality violation I have plotted here also the different curves for the cuts the two different strategies strategies for example with the first one that is the the one that has already been implemented for the work of Higgs, of Higgs to set set, we can find that the uh, violation is almost optimal in the um, in the permitted range. 
while as we move into lower values of C or larger values of C, for example, when doing no cut, we can see how the violation stops or more or less minus 1.5 and here on 2, 2.5. However, this does not happen when taking into account the second strategy. And the only problem is that as we move into larger values of C and lower values of C, these violations, this violation tends to the local unrealistic limit. This is the violation tends to two. However, it is ensured, at least theoretically, that the violation happens. And finally, let me uh, present some uh, resistance to noise. Why I have presented this? Because in reality, we don't have some, I mean, we cannot extract the corresponding density matrix, the corresponding the density matrix associated with a um, with a process without taking into account the background. We have to take it into account. So uh, here I present what it is called resistant to noise. That is the minimal mixture of this state that is just a convex combination of um, our, our real estate plus some, in this case, I have chosen the white noise because in practice one should put here the corresponding density matrix associated with the background in case you know which is, which is this matrix. But as a first approximation, one can see how it is uh, resistant uh, for white noise. So um, as I was mentioning, uh, resistant to noise is the minimal mixture for which this matrix density stops violating the Vienna inequality. And this is given by this question over here. So for uh, the different values that we have to take into account, we can see that, for example, in the allowed region for the Higgs to set set, the um, resistance to noise is about uh, 20%. While uh, when we implement certain cuts, this can be lowered up to almost 25, 30%. So let me jump finally to the conclusions. So um, the density matrix of an ensemble of devotion and scalar state in terms of the most general Lorentz invariance and CPT conserving coupling can be determined via analytical methods. Not only that, but in, for those states, the perez horodeke criterion remains as a necessary and sufficient condition for entanglement. And we have also uh, given a new optimization strategy that ensures the violation of the Berlin inequality. This is something, as I mentioned before, highly non-trivial for entangled mixed states. And we have applied all of these results, but for the case of Higgs decaying into set set and decaying then into charged leptons, when we have introduced an anomalous coupling between the Higgs and the set bosons. And this is all. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, you have shown the elements of the density operator in terms of a C. Do you have in the expressions also for the the C's of the of the of the correlations? I mean the 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 spin correlations. Uh, what do you mean exactly? The C's we use in the paper. Ah no, I, I mean I can obtain it because it's just <laughs> using the mathematical file and so on. Uh, actually, I have the expressions because in the end the C, I mean the C that we used, for example, in the previous um, work, is just given by the combination of the vertices that are introduced here. So by plugging the corresponding relation between these vertices and C, I can obtain the final expression yeah, my, of the uh, My interest is, is to see if uh, there is some zero or whatever, or whatever is small that is enhanced when you have the, the anomalous interactions. Well, no, I mean, I, I don't know why I, have, why I have mentioned all of this, because well, in our case, I mean, D and A are just going to be the C222 minus two and C21, whatever, that we have in the, our previous work. So. The corresponding is one to one. I mean, D is equal to not okay, and A is going to be equal to whatever. Okay. But okay. Um, in this case, the the corresponding C and C two 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 and blah blah and C blah blah blah, blah is just going to be some function of C. And obviously, here we you have a zero, but I mean it's one point for sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions? It's not so much a question, but just an observation that yes, when you, when you look at how these uh, entanglement and Bell violation changes a function of the anomalous parameters, um, we're seeing neither maximization of the 
of the entanglement nor minimization of the entanglement in this case nature seems to have chosen something that's in between so yeah. that's, <laughs> yes so, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually that's true i mean yeah, yeah. like um, violating all the principles that we might have heard yeah about because before. there is no like any kind of minimal here and no, it's completely true. I mean, the minimal values are obtained when C are extending to infinite or C yeah. extending to minus infinite. So it's not like any kind of motivation to say that minimal entangle will have an impact on this kind of processes. Yeah. And maximal entangle, for example, we can see that it's corresponding to, to these kind of values for C that are completely out of the allowed region. I think in this case, nature just got it wrong. Yes, nature yeah, decided to, to mess things up. I can ask. <laughs> And uh, yeah, on this um, yeah, thanks for the for the talk on this uh, noise thing. Can you connect it yeah, with yeah. Uh, some type of like a physical uh, uh, effect? The noise. Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, the noise is a way of like modeling the uh, the effect of a background in your uh, actual reconstruction of the density matrix. I mean, in the sense that if you reconstruct the density matrix using some kind of quantum tomography methods, you will not reconstruct this. You will reconstruct some kind of raw noise that is in part the real matrix density that you want to reconstruct time or well, plus the corresponding background density matrix that is the density matrix associated with the background that you cannot like remove. So. Right it's directly related to some physical so you have more in mind the the, the background of the yeah, but the, in this case, the as i don't have like a model for the background i just have mm, chosen the the white noise that is the standard way of looking at the at the resistance tonight. right you yeah. cannot connect with some kind of like a, another channel that you could evolve and then tracing out uh, this kind of stuff mm, i don't uh, Quite understand the question. Maybe we'll do. okay. We'll we, can, we can discuss it. Okay. Thank you for, for, for the very interesting talk. So this uh, this result is general for any theory that is symmetric Lorentz covariant and yes. coupling pseudo scalar to two bosons. Yes. So in that sense, it seems universal, right? So my question is, you have asymmetry in this entanglement, and on the left-hand side, you have a you know non-smooth point. Yes. So have you checked what is this um, C here? Yeah, for, yes. is there anything, if you make this, you know, continuous <laughs> masses, you would have, you know, special kind of line of C's. What is that? This is actually related to the, the point that cancels D. So when D is equals to zero, we have a change in the uh, values of the, uh, of the eigenvalues of the partially transposed matrix. So it goes from lowering the value of the eigenvalues up to zero, and then again, uh, going to negative values or the other way around. And because we have the modulus of the eigenvalues, this is translated in the end as the cusp that we see or hear. Like, right. I mean, yeah. uh -huh. so, so, right, but there is nothing deep in the, I the, the original say, theory itself. No, it's more the way of parameterizing the entanglement that because of using the eigenvalues, you have to deal with the fact that maybe the eigenvalues changes it and change its sign. So this, because of logarithmic being monotonic and the norm being monotonic and so on, leads to a cusp on the on the on the entanglement measure. Okay, but somehow it still tells something about the relation of the two first term in the coupling, right? Yes. So maybe there is something more deep that is you know not understood first at the first. Yes, maybe maybe it's possible to find. I mean because this and in the end this coefficient is just one of or a combination of this kind of integral so one can try to obtain the corresponding value of c that cancels this particular combination and express everything in terms of this distribution function and see if 
there is some kind of special relations between the parameters that leads to this cancellation. But in principle, as one can lead, uh, one can put here for m, v, and the width any value that one can that one wants. I don't know whether it is something really, uh, let's say, proper of the theory or just some numerical issue. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't see any other question. So let's thank the speaker again.